Went all the way up to the district finals. I think speech time was the ultimate sport. Good evening, everybody. Fishing. Fishing. Welcome to Harper College Toastmasters Open House. Good to see you all. Uh, we'll start off by, by reading the mission statement. The mission of a Toastmaster Club is to provide a mutually supportive and positive learning environment in which every member has the opportunity to develop and practice communication and leadership skills, which in turn fosters self-confidence and personal growth. With this, Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Devinder. Who doesn't know what device of mass distraction is? Who hasn't heard me use that term? Okay, let me explain to you what the device of mass distraction is. If you have this noise-making device, device of mass distraction, but we're going to try something a little bit different this evening. This is your first test exercise to see how good your interpersonal skills are. So what I'd like you to do is turn to the person on your left and say, Amy, would you be so kind as to turn off your cell phone so that we don't interrupt our speakers and presenters this evening? As a courtesy to that. So in case your cell phone goes off or your noise making device goes off, we have a little jar over there where you have to deposit $25 to our favorite charity. Fair enough deal? Okay, thank you so much. As the vendor said, this is really a night about collaboration, connection, communication, and how three clubs can come together in unity to be unified. And even though we share the same campus, meaning Harper College, it really took a Herculean effort to make this all come about. And we really appreciate all of you being here this evening, because I know you could choose to do other things this evening. Yet you chose to come to the open house tonight and to support Harper Toastmasters, who is the primary sponsor of tonight's event, Toastmasters Plus, and Toastmasters on Purpose, which is the only advanced club in the Northwest suburbs. You'll be hearing about all three clubs this evening. And I know most of the experienced Toastmasters in the room this evening, but if I could just see a show of hands, because I want to welcome our guests this evening, if you could just please raise your hand if you're a guest tonight. Okay, well welcome to all of our guests. When we go to the break, we want you to meet and mingle. So that you can meet some new fellow Toastmaster friends, make some new connections. Because the other part about Toastmasters is really the networking opportunity and to establish and connect different relationships with different Toastmasters, not only from your club, but from the area, from the division, and literally tonight, all across the district. So you really have that opportunity. As your Toastmasters this evening, let's get right into the agenda. And tonight, we have an opportunity, again, to have a shared collaboration between a lot of different clubs in terms of some of the roles this evening. So, Martina Matisson, who is a member of Toastmasters POA, Toastmasters of Algonquin, and Crystal Lake Toastmasters, she's going to do our invocation and pledge this evening. So please help me welcome to the lecture, Martina Matisson. with the mastermind theory. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and a welcome guest. The mastermind theory suggests that I have my own thoughts, ideas, and creativity, and you have your own thoughts, ideas, and creativity, and yet when we connect, a third mind is born. That's the mastermind theory with its own thoughts, ideas, and creativity. We have an opportunity for a similar expansion of thought as we collaborate tonight as Toastmasters. I read something by Theodore Zeldin. When minds meet, they don't just exchange facts, they transform them, reshape them, draw different implications from them, and engage in a new thought. We're not just meeting as clubs, as a collaboration of clubs, we're investing in a network of resources. We're investing in opportunities to see, hear, and express new ideas. Rising tide raises all boats. Thank you for coming tonight and investing in relationships, friendships, Toastmasters, and yourselves so we all may enjoy a rising tide. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I 
Accessing the internet was almost impossible. So um, let me write this real quickly. Now this word I picked ostensible or ostensibly. I picked it because unfortunately I can never say it right. I always put a B in there. I always want to stay, say ostensibly, but it's not. Ostensibly. So ostensibly means where did it go? Where did it go? See what happens? Denial of service. It's denied my, denied my service. Yeah. It means outwardly appearing as such, professed. So in many cases, it's the outward appearance of something when maybe something else really is going on. So let me give you an example. Um, a lot of times you might see in a comedy show, a comedy sketch, uh, uh, some attractive woman moving into an apartment. And what happens? The single guys in the apartment go over to ostensibly, I did it, to ostensibly borrow sugar when they're really there to meet her. So that's a use of the word. Uh, I'm going to try to use it over the next couple of weeks. I encourage you to do that too. And I'm going to try as hard as I can not to put a B in that word. Okay. Mr. Tosex. deny the service now. Tell yeah. Them, okay. <laughs> One tidbit though for Toastmasters, see when things like that happen, we never apologize, right? We just go on with it. No matter what happens, if there's a glitch, an AV, anything else, we just continue on like nothing happened. Because sometimes when we do that, we kind of bring attention to it. So it's all good, Tom. It's all good. Now we move on to our joke master for this evening to kind of lighten the tone of the meeting. And here to share with us a phenomenal joke this evening from what he's told me is none other than the Area 6 Area Governor, Mr. Glenn Reed. Go ahead. I extensively <coughs> called a restaurant to make a reservation for a large party. I asked if there was a partition 
They said, I'm sorry, she's out. She'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> Will Rogers uh, is one of my favorite uh, wits, and a few of his jokes I'd like to, or funny things he said are, I don't make jokes, I just watch the government and report the facts. <laughs> <laughs> Another one, good judgment comes from experience, and a lot of that comes from bad judgment. <laughs> Never miss a good chance to shut up. Do you ever wonder, that's a, another category of joke I, I like, do you ever wonder why lemon juice is made with artificial flavor and dishwashing liquid is made with real lemon? <laughs> <laughs> why do people say, I slept like a baby when babies sleep two hours at a time? <laughs> why does Goofy stand up and Pluto walks around on all four legs? They're both dogs. Why does the alphabet song and Twinkle Twinkle Little Star both have the same tune? Then there's uh, bar jokes, which we don't say in to Toastmasters too often, but then again, it's always a good call about it. A sandwich walks into a bar, and the bartender says, I'm sorry, we don't serve food in here. <laughs> a three-legged dog walks into a bar and says, who shot my paw? <laughs> a rabbi, a priest, and a pastor walk into a bar, and the bartender says, is this some kind of joke? <laughs> finally, I'd like to wrap up with a Halloween joke. What's the best pasta to have on Halloween? Fettuccine Alfredo. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, Mr. Area Governor. <laughs> You just never know what we'll hear when it comes to the jokes, do we? It's going to be a little bit of a change in our agenda this evening because Barry Mixon, who is our guest speaker this evening, our keynote speaker, he's now sitting in traffic just outside of the loop. So in terms of timing, we may shift the speeches around just a little bit and we'll get into perhaps some of the overviews a little bit quicker. But what I'd like to do now, especially for our guests, and of course we have many experienced Toastmasters, in the room this evening. I'd like to just have a conversation, not only with our guests, but also with our experienced Toastmasters this evening. And I thought about this before the open house tonight and how I would talk about Toastmasters. And let me start with this. Those of you who know me, I love quotes. And Barry, if he were here, he'd say that I'm the acronym king. Well, I'm not going to try to dispense with acronyms this evening. But I want to share a couple of quotes I think that's applicable to Toastmasters. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who's one of my favorite authors, said, Speech is power. Speech is to persuade, to convert, and to compel. We, as Toastmasters, we have this power. All our guests this evening also have this power. The power to use language, to share ideas, to touch hearts, and to bring about change. But more specifically, as Toastmasters, we have the power to speak and share, to explain and to educate, to inspire and to influence. And as you may have heard, with great power comes great responsibility. So as Toastmasters and even our fellow guests, you have this power, the power to speak and share, to share your story, to share your experiences, to share your knowledge. It's almost like the big what if. Diane and I were having a conversation and we were talking about the fear of just getting up and speaking in front of an audience. And the biggest what if is, what if I don't have anything to say that anyone would be interested in hearing? What if I don't have anything to say that anyone would be interested in hearing? Well, guess what? There are approximately, how many Toastmasters, John? 4,999 Toastmasters in District 30. Each one of those Toastmasters, each one of you has a voice. You have experiences, life experiences, and you have knowledge that you can share. So whatever fear you may have, whatever trepidation, reluctance, to get up and just speak in front of an audience, you have a story to tell. And to me, that's one of the biggest assets of Toastmasters. 
is I've heard some amazing stories. So when we talk about to inspire, to influence, to explain, and to educate, to entertain, we as Toastmasters, we have all those talents and skills that we can share with not only our fellow Toastmasters, but with everyone outside of Toastmasters. Toastmasters is going to celebrate 88 years on October, what, John? October 20th or so, I believe. And this evening, right here, right now, I'd like you to think about shifting into a higher consciousness of what Dr. Smedley really gave us. Dr. Smedley really gave us the gift of communication. He gave us the gift that just keeps on giving and giving and giving. It's a gift that we can pass on, that we can pay forward. And someone said that communication is depositing a part of yourself in another person. That's what we do when we invite someone to a Toastmaster meeting and to experience Toastmasters for themselves. Because I think we would all agree, whatever their perception is before they walk into a Toastmaster meeting, it's completely different once they experience a Toastmaster meeting. And we still are the best kept secret, and of course we'd like it to be the worst kept secret. Because we know how it can transform lives, we know how it can impact people, and the power that it has when you share your voice, when you communicate, and you connect, and you collaborate, as the three clubs are doing at Harvard tonight. So there's no greater gift than we can give a person but that gift of communication by joining Toastmasters and improving their communication and leadership skills. As I said, it was formed with a built-in opportunity to pass it on. And it just keeps on giving and giving and giving. Toastmasters today, there are 14,000 clubs. There are 300,000 members. We're in 117 different countries. It's the only organization I think any of us could think of that really fosters not only communication, but it helps develop leaders in each and every one of our members if they choose to follow that track. So at whatever level, whether they've managed a team or an individual, they have that opportunity in Toastmasters. So the communication side of it, which we all focus on, but the leadership side of it, is another critical component of the Toastmaster experience. And we need to keep that top of mind. Let me close with saying that I believe that we all came together this evening for a reason. The people that need to be here are here this evening. The people that didn't show up, they're missing out on a golden <coughs> opportunity to network with their fellow Toastmasters, but to grow, to learn, to fellowship, and to connect with one another. Because that's one of the greatest things about Toastmasters, is that you have that opportunity to connect with another human being, but a fellow Toastmaster, and we're all on that same journey. Some of us are at the beginning of the journey, some are kind of middle of the journey, and some of us are a little bit farther along. But we all share that same vision, that goal, that mission to improve our communication and our leadership skills. So as you think about this this evening, think about this. The worst speech you'll ever give will be far better than the one you never give. So thank you for coming this evening. Thank you for sharing in this Toastmaster experience. And now we're going to move on to the next part of our agenda where we are going to go through an overview of each one of our individual clubs and Rick Westcott, who is the president of Harper Toastmasters, is up first and he'll talk about Harper, which is just one of three clubs on campus and the differences in Harper compared to Toastmasters Plus and then the last presentation, Valerie will talk about top and then in the middle, Joe Rifkin will talk about Toastmasters Plus. So please help me welcome to the lectern the president of Harper Toastmasters, Mr. Rick Westcott. Thank you, thank you, thank you fellow Toastmasters, dignitaries, and most welcome guests. The Harper 
College Toastmasters Club was founded in October 2009. It was sponsored by one of the departments here at Harper College. It's the Workforce and Economic, uh, Economic Improvement Department, and they run a program called the Harper Stimulus Program. And you'll notice that they advertise this right on the back. So we get a lot of people that are going through transition that stop in. We also have students. Uh, I was hoping to see more students tonight, but I don't see as many as I wanted to. Two years ago, we had a student that in his sophomore year that was president of the club. And we're pretty proud of that, because that's pretty neat to see somebody that's in a leadership role that's not even 21 yet. Uh, the only challenge we have is that they leave us every two years, and then we got to give more back. And uh, we did advertise with the speech club, English as a second language club. The Harvard Club's pretty diverse. Uh, we had 20 people as members starting uh, July 1st, so we made president select. Uh, we made our nine out of ten goals, so we didn't make the top one, but we we're in the second one, and I think I'm right about president select. So we intend to do that again. We typically bring on six to eight new members every year. Uh, when I say we're diverse, we range from mid-twenties all the way up to guys like me. <laughs> Mature. So, so, but it's kind of interesting because we had a tabletop contest and there were three winners. I was number three. And the questions were, you had two sentences to tell the generation coming up, what would you say? And here, as the guy who's 60-ish, uh, I'm talking about integrity, do unto others like you do unto self. The 26-year-old got up and says, seize the day, live for the day. I don't think there's gonna, the world's going to end in 2012. And what I tell my two younger brothers is, make mistakes. Because I hated those stories my dad told me. They said, learn by our mistakes. No, Dad, these stories are terrible. And then what a contrast between the two. And that's why I love our club, is because we go from 20 up to more mature people. And we have a lot in between. We're about half female, half male. Uh, we have seven uh, people that are descendants of India. We have a couple of Pacific Rim. So that's where we got our diversity. It's age, it's gender, it's ethnic. And we have a lot of fun. Uh, this, is, this is how our agendas typically look. And we run for two hours. We pick Thursday nights because most of the college students would like to go out Friday nights and Thursday nights and come here, practice their 30 second go around, table topics, and be ready for conversation on Friday. So, thank you for coming to our club. I wanted to ask does everybody have an agenda? All right, so everybody's. We don't. We got some. If we have some extra Joe, can you uh, pass some? It's right there in the folder, Joe. The blue on top of the soda, the cool right right below Joe. Yeah, just yeah. to take the stack and hand them to them. Um, what I did want to point out is that we also have diversity in our speaking speakers. We have people that typically at a meeting we'll have an icebreaker, we'll have an intermediate speak, somebody who's doing the fourth or fifth speech, and then we also have, and I, I neglected to say it, we have advanced speakers. So. We usually rank them icebreaker, intermediate, <coughs> and then a dad speaker. So we like that about our club too. So without saying anything else, you got to give us the times and the times and the places that your club okay. meets. Okay. Um, we actually meet in the building next door, but since we Harper is so kind to let all three clubs meet here for free, <laughs> sometimes what happens is the classes take priority over our meeting rooms, so they move us every semester. And we get confused at the beginning of every semester. This semester, till so December 20th, we're meeting a little bit down the hall here to the left in room J164. And we meet from 7 to 9, the uh, second and first and third Thursdays. So of every month. Any so other questions? The first and third or the second and fourth? It's the first and third Thursdays. So it's first and third Thursdays at Harper College, room... J-164. 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 And then uh, it's from 7 to 9 o'clock. All right, thanks. A.M. or P.M.? P.M. I'll let the, the, the early bird yeah. talk about A.M.s.
But that's it, Jerry. I have to give really a debt of gratitude and appreciation to Rick because Rick was very instrumental in helping to coordinate this event tonight. The amount of energy and effort that he put into it is just amazing because he and I have been planning this along with John and Joe and everybody else involved in the three clubs literally for about, what, two and a half months? And so we really put a lot of thought into it because with three clubs being on the same campus, we really connect with one another. And since we're all friends and fellow Toastmasters, it's an opportunity for us to share. If we have someone in our club, we can recommend to go to Harper or to John and Joe's club, which meets at 7.15 in the morning, which Joe was talking about. So it's really a nice situation for all three clubs to be here on campus. So now we're going to hear from Toastmasters Plus. Joe Rifkin is going to give us a Toastmasters Plus overview. And they are an early riser club. And Joe will tell you all about that. Please help me welcome to the lecture. Joe oh, what a beautiful morning. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful day. Come Monday, it'll be all right. Come Monday, Toastmasters Plus will treat you right. <laughs> First and third Monday, Harper College, this semester in room J259, 715 to 845. A. A.M. 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 J259, 715 A.M. First and third Monday. And you're right, sometimes Monday is a Labor Day, sometimes Monday is a holiday. And so we accommodate. Fortunately, with the website that John Labby has helped administer, it's really worked nicely. Our club three years ago had 33 members. Now we're looking at about a small handful and a half. So if any of you need speaking slots and you'd like to come in the early morning, some people say that early Monday morning just starts the week off right. <laughs> Even those that claim they're not Monday morning people, or morning people at all. You know, a Toastmasters experience starts that week and just makes it roar. A number of the people in our club over the years have credited the Toastmasters experience that we've heard well about tonight for their advancement at their company, their ability to get up and make a presentation in front of peers or in front of management people especially with their ability to advance. Others have said that the Toastmasters experience table topics. The 32nd go around helped them advance simply because they were able to go to an interview in a more comfortable fashion. You experience Toastmasters, you know this. You know that the preparation and organization that goes into speaking, the ability to be able to distill your thoughts, to be able to present your thoughts in a cogent and well-organized manner, taking up enough time but not too much, bodes them well, whether it's a sales situation, whether it's a personal situation at work. I'm told it even helps in personal situations at home. <laughs> but I'm not sure I get one to two minutes to be able to express. <laughs> <laughs> At least I'd like to think so. Five to seven sometimes, but not quite. So if you're there Monday morning, we welcome you. For new folk, come on down and see what we're about. Our group just grew by almost 20% this past week. <laughs> and we hope to expand the club, and we're working to do just that very thing. So I'd like to thank Jerry, I'd like to thank John, I'd like to thank everyone that participated. First, everyone that came from distances all over the district. And for people that helped put this meeting together, thank you so much. Thank you, John. Who belongs to an early morning club? Anybody belong to an early morning club? What time does your club meet? I'm with John. Oh, you're part of John. <laughs> okay, hi. Let everybody know what club you're with. Saturday sunrise. And when you meet? Oak Park, 8 o'clock in the morning to 10. On a Saturday. On Saturday. 
And Jeremiah Henderson is also part of Saturday Morning Sunrise. They meet at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And I have been to their club many times. It's a very energetic, enthusiastic club. And in terms of diversity, again, they've got tremendous diversity. And <coughs> Teresa Jones, who is near and dear to Jeremiah, she wasn't able to be with us this evening. But I would recommend, other than going to Toastmasters Plus on campus, that you certainly visit Jeremiah and High's Club, because it is really a great place to, to have a Toastmasters meeting. And now we come to our third club on campus, and that's near and dear, of course, to my heart, because it's Toastmasters on Purpose, top as we refer to it, when you want to elevate your evaluation, so to speak. And here to share Toastmasters on Purpose with us is our president, Valerie Fusan. Valerie.
So you get to develop your speeches in our club and do 10, 15, 20 minute sec sections of your 45 minute or hour presentation. There's leadership opportunities. All of our members are actually very, very involved in the district. And Joan loves that, don't you Joan? Yes. <laughs> we actually have the highest <coughs> DTMs, the highest distinguished Toastmasters per club in, in our club. We have six or seven DTMs, eight. Eight, eight DTMs in our club alone. And we have, I think, 15, around 15 or 16 members. Our, the meeting room that we have right now is a dynamite meeting room because it has internet access and it has a PowerPoint opportunity for, your, for you to develop your slides in. <laughs> so it's a great, great meeting room because it's, it's more of a professional room than some of the other uh, meetings. We're meeting in the library or other, other areas. So you really get to practice your speech as if you were going to, do, to show it, uh, to present it to a, a large audience. And you also have a joint venture opportunity because you, there are other speakers in our, in our club that are speakers or trainers we're, that we're working on doing joint ventures with, with other members in our club or outside of our club that are speakers, professional speakers, to do joint ventures. And that's, that's dynamite. Because you're not doing it alone now, you're actually doing it with other people. All of our members belong to two to three clubs. Anyone belong to more? <laughs> <laughs> so we all are very involved with Toastmasters and in our district. We, most of us volunteer every year to do something at the, at the district level. So come, come and join us and we will help you develop leadership skills also. And most of our, our members are what we have past, past, two past district governors in our, in our club. And Three. A, a lot of other, pardon? Three. 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 So, and our, uh, Adana is also in, in our, uh, the district officer. So we're really involved in the district. Mm -hmm. We really want you to come in and see what it's like. <laughs> because uh, we're going to have, later on we're going to do an evaluation on the vendor. And we're going to show you what our evaluations are like. So do come. Our room number is X231 at Harper, X231. We meet from 7 to 9 p.m. on the first and third Wednesday of the month. If we have contests, we might have to change that, but mostly that's when we meet. <coughs> so do come and visit, and we will, we have a lot of fun in our club. Yes, <laughs> Thank you, Valerie. Okay, as I said in the announcements in the beginning, we're going to switch Barry around. So what we're going to do is I'm going to call up my fellow Toastmaster and our Northwest Division Governor, Mr. John Labby, and he's going to give us a presentation this evening. And then after that, we'll have the vendor come up. And as Valerie said, you're going to have the opportunity to see how we evaluate in town and then the vendor will basically be our target speaker and all of you, since you have the forms, you'll have an opportunity to evaluate along with us. We'll have two Toastmasters from TAP that will actually be giving an evaluation of the vendor's speech. So without further ado, let me welcome my fellow Toastmaster and our Northwest Division Governor, Mr. John Lavin. Thank you, Mr. Toastmaster. <coughs> Fellow Toastmasters, guests. They say that laughter is good for the soul. They say that laughter is the best medicine. Tonight, I would like to share with you a story so that you will also believe that Toastmasters is good medicine. <coughs> Four years ago, I 
I did what they call hit bottom. I entered a period of clinical depression that left me many days of the week feeling that emptying the dishwasher made it an exceptionally accomplished day. Period of acceptance, therapy, various activities and exercises all made a difference, and yet they didn't. After nearly a year of working on that circumstance, that condition, I was still struggling. And one day I got an email, an email from someone many of you know, Srinivas Saini. I read the email and it said, John, we would like you to join a brand new advanced club. You'll be meeting here in the northwest suburbs. I think this would be a great opportunity for you to grow as a Toastmaster. Well, at first I was thinking, oh, that's pretty cool. A guy who's about to become division district governor writing to me, inviting me to join this great club. Then I thought, wait a minute. There like 12,000 people he could have sent this to. My confidence level was so low that I assumed that there were over there were thousands of people who had received that email. And I came this close to deleting it. And then I noticed that the first meeting was coming up on a night when my wife was already going to be out of the house anyway. And so on that off coincidence, I attended my first meeting of what became Toastmasters on purpose. And that was my turnaround moment. By participating in Toastmasters in purpose, a couple of things happened. As Valerie shared, that put me into a den of, well not thieves, but a den of <laughs> <laughs> district officers who if they would ever get a chance, we'll steal your time. <laughs> Not long after being in the club, somebody encouraged me to get into the fall contest, which I did. Did okay. Somebody encouraged me to go visit other clubs. I believe this was the first year of the club ambassador program. <laughs> and I got invited to a, a holiday celebration at one of the clubs out by Crystal Lake. So I went. I think I did an evaluation. So I was starting to feel like evaluations were kind of my thing. We've been doing, been doing so many evaluations at Toastmasters on purpose. And it felt good to do an evaluation in, a, in an unusual space. And pretty soon, just going to a Toastmasters meeting became like a drug. I guess I would come out so pumped, so positive. It was a feeling that I was not at all familiar with. You go to a Toastmasters meeting, you stand up and you get applause. <laughs> <laughs> Say something, anything, you get applause. <laughs> Sit back down, you get a floor. <laughs> it's really hard to stay depressed in a Toastmasters club. <laughs> I've tried! <laughs> it's not easy. This is one of the most affirming environments I've ever known. By February, so eight months or so perhaps after I started attending the meetings of Toastmasters on purpose, I was getting engaged in doing demonstration meetings. And it wasn't long after that that something clicked and said, you know, I've, I've had so much fun giving to other clubs by visiting, doing evaluations, doing an occasional speech, helping out with these demonstration meetings, 
I want more of this. I want to mainline it. So I became an area governor. <laughs> and I have to tell you that I am not the same person I was four years ago. Not even remotely. And I credit Toastmasters for that change. Some of the things that were involved, all of that affirmation that we just laughed about, it's real. It is absolutely real. One of the things that people in, in, uh, in depression struggle with is goal setting. The Club Ambassador Program gave me a concrete set of goals. I started working in it, on it in December, and I set the goal of having visited 12 clubs by June when the program went in. I think I hit 13 or 14. It was a blast. Something else that people with depression struggle with is being involved so deeply only in themselves. And by engaging in Toastmasters, I get out of that. I became completely involved in what other people were doing, helping them grow, helping other clubs grow. Toastmasters changes lives. Do you know? We don't change. The old joke is how many psychiatrists does it take to, to change a light bulb, right? Only one, but the light bulb wants to change. Has to want to change. <laughs> People have to want to change as well. And so, while it is true to say that Toastmasters changes lives, I would like to amend that to say that each Toastmaster changes lives. So if you are curious about visiting another club, curious about joining your first Toastmasters club, or wondering about joining Toastmasters on Purpose, the advanced club, that message that you're hearing in your head that brought you here tonight, listen to it. That message is telling you change is in my blood. That little message is telling you change is not only possible, it is important. Let Toastmasters change your life. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, John. I remember vividly when we started Toastmasters on purpose because John, along with Amy, myself, Bob Roman, and a number of other Toastmasters who are in the room this evening are the founding members of Toastmasters on purpose. There had never been an advanced club in the northwest suburbs for ever, Bob, or maybe eons ago. And so we had a golden opportunity when we put that together really for more experienced Toastmasters to come together, and as John said in his speech, all of us, it was a learning process for us too. Because even though we all belong to multiple clubs, when we got together, just the synergy of all the experienced Toastmasters, the knowledge and the experience, we could all draw upon that energy from one another. When John talked about change, the one of the most powerful things in Toastmasters is that it changes our life and we can keep the change. They say there's only two things, two people in life that don't like change. It's a baby with a wet diaper and a cashier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Think about that for a moment. <coughs> now, following up with John, when he's talking about Toastmasters on purpose, we're going to hear from Devinder Kohli. And the way we're going to do this is Devinder is going to give his speech. You all have the form that Valerie talked about, and you'll have an opportunity to follow along. So you're going to be looking for four things. You're going to be looking for the vocal, the visual, connectedness, and preparedness of his speech. And then you have sub-points underneath one of those primary categories. So just kind of jot some notes down, because afterwards, Virginia Bossman and Bob are going to come up 
in the general evaluation portion, and they're going to evaluate the vendor speech, Toastmasters on Purpose style. And then you as our audience, we're going to have a round robin, so we're going to go around the room, and you'll be able to provide some additional feedback to the vendor so can, he can improve going forward. The speech is five to seven minutes. The title of his speech is Finding Our Element. Finding Our Element, please help me welcome to the lectern, Devinder Kohli. My show of hand over here, how many of you absolutely love and adore what you do at work? And before you raise your hands, let me also add, after a long day at work, you still feel fresh and you're willing to take up more. If you still feel that way, you're certainly in your element, my friend. For those who don't like what they do at work, they need to find their element. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and guests. <clears throat> so we often hear movie stars and sports celebrities saying, I'm in my element. So what do they really mean when they say, I'm in my element? So, element is a meeting point between natural aptitude and personal passion. And why is it important for us to find our element? Because it makes us more fulfilled. The world around us is evolving and the very future of our communities and institutions depends on us being fulfilled. Each one of us here has an extraordinary potential of being who we, who we want to be. <clears throat> we just need to find our passion and our distinctive talents. We were all born with natural some natural capacities, but somehow, as part of growing up, we just lost in touch with them. <clears throat> so besides passion and aptitude, there are two other important conditions finding the element and those are attitude and opportunity and there are four stages in finding the element the first one is I like it I love it I want it and where is it <clears throat> so let's let's take a deeper dive into these stages I like it this is all about aptitude each one of us over here has to find out our distinctive talents and what we are good at some of us are good at science some at sports some at medicine, some at public speaking. So as a result of our aptitude, we are employed. <clears throat> so that's a like it stage. The second stage is, I love it. This is about passion. People who are in their element take deep pleasure in what they do. So once after a mu musical concert, I complimented a musician on his ability to play the Indian instrument called the tabla. My daughter also plays the same instrument. So I asked him, what would it take for my daughter to get to his level? And his answer was, I prepare at least four to five hours on the tabla each day in spite of my performances. So I said, now how do you manage doing all this stuff? And his answer was, I just simply love it. So the second stage, I love it, is all about your passion. <clears throat> Third stage is about, is I want it. And this is all about attitude. People, we often hear people describe their successes as being lucky and failures as being unlucky. There is more to luck than pure chance. High achievers often share the same attitude. Perseverance, self-belief, confidence, and even frustration. <clears throat> so how we perceive our circumstances and what opportunities we create and take from that largely depends on what we expect of ourselves. So Michael Phelps, during his interview with NBC, during the Olympics, admitted that he was tired of losing his races. And he started working hard. He wanted to get to the next level. And now we know him as a, the most decorated Olympian. Uh, fourth stage is the where is it. And this is about opportunity. We know without the right opportunity, we may never be able to find our aptitude. <clears throat> we know for sure that there aren't any Bronco riders in the Antarctica. <laughs> or there aren't any pearl divers in Sahara Desert. So without the right opportunity, we may never be able to discover our true aptitude. <laughs> so it's important for all of us to get connected with people who share the same passion as us. <clears throat> we, all, we need to constantly seek opportunities that will get us connected with those people and to find our, our aptitudes. So for those who closely watch the Summer Olympics this year, you might have come across this wonderful person and gymnast by the name of Gabby Douglas. Her aptitude for the sport of gymnastics was discovered at the age of three. And she 
and this is called the Likert stage. At the age of eight, she won the Virginia State Olympic uh, uh, Gymnastics. She worked hard with passion to get to this level, and this is called the I Love It stage. Now she wanted to take her game to the next level. She wanted to be in the be an Olympian. She wanted to be in the Olympics. So, and this was the desire that she had. So she got, <coughs> and this is called the I Want It stage. And now she couldn't get that opportunity with her own hometown. So she had to find out the opportunity to go to others, to a different state, to be connected with people who shared the same passion as, as her. And she got connected with Lian Chao, who was her coach. And now we know her as the first African American to win a gold medal in gymnastics. She was truly in her element. So I discovered my aptitude for software development uh, when I was in graduate school. I literally picked up the skill by watching two of my uh, friends coding. And this is how I describe my like it stage. Uh, I loved it so much that I made a career out of that. And this is because of my, my passion for that software development. And this is called my, my love it stage. So currently I'm in my wanted stage because I want to take my game to the next level. I want to build my own products. And I'm always constantly looking for opportunities to connect with people who share the same passion as, as mine. So I truly hope tonight that all of us here can find our element so that we can have a fulfilled life. I would like to conclude by saying a, a uh, quote from Michelangelo. Angelo. He said, the greatest danger for all of us is not that we aim too high and we miss it, but we aim, but it's too low and we reach it. Thank you. Mr. Postmaster. Thank you. The vendor, how far along are you now? Uh, four feet. So. I've attended Harper quite often. Rick, I think, haven't you made me an honorary member since I've been there so many times? But I had the opportunity to hear the vendor when he gave his icebreaker, and he's really been on a fast track. And it's great to, because he came to top. He was courageous enough to allow us to evaluate him. He did a wonderful job there, and as Valerie said earlier, for those of you that have any trepidation about going to other clubs, we certainly welcome you to come to top because even if you're giving your icebreaker. You can come to top and be evaluated on your icebreaker. And we'll be gentle on you. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> you don't have to be intimidated by that. I think I actually hold the record for the longest evaluation on top. And that Bob, you'll hear from Bob early, later. I think he, on my first speech, he evaluated me for five and a half minutes. And I said, Bob, did you find anything good about my speech at all? He goes, Jerry! It was all good. You can take it. And I said, maybe I missed something. Maybe I missed something. <laughs> my listening skills when you gave me that evaluation. But it really is terrific. So now what we're going to do, we're going to take a short break for about 10 minutes. And hopefully by then, Mr. Barry Mixon will be here. And then we're going to resume with table topics. And then I think what we'll do, we'll do table topics. And then after that, Barry should be here by then. So then he can give his keynote, and then we'll wrap it up and with uh, some questions and feedback from our guests and everything. So please, Rick. I just want to say one thing, Jerry. Yes. Yeah. John Labby said, you heard this expression, take no prisoners, please. We take no leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> Have some. So we'll take a 10-minute break. Please help yourself. Please meet and mingle with everyone. Introduce yourself to fellow Postmasters. Did everybody get enough to eat, drink, fellowship, meet and greet, meet and mingle? If you haven't met your fellow Toastmasters before you leave, please do so. You never know. You never know. Okay, now we're going to get into the fun part of the meeting. And here to lead us in this portion as the table topics extraordinaire. <laughs> he is a member of Harper Toastmaster, 
And please help me welcome to the lectern our Table Topics Master for this evening, Mr. Mike Kuczynski. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, honored guests, dignitaries, this is an honor for me to be here amongst this kind of talent. So, so thank you uh, for the opportunity tonight. Uh, tonight, I'm serving as your Table Topics Master and as you all know, Table Topics gives us a chance to speak on an impromptu basis. It gives us a chance to speak off the fly or on the cuff. And as you know, in Toastmasters, those two terms are not really allowed as far as your speeches go. So here's a chance for everyone here to what? Break the rules. <laughs> Let's break the rules. Let's start right off. All kinds of companies these days, including where I work, we're trying to develop a social media strategy. And basically, it's designed to enhance the buying process. And I'm talking about LinkedIn, I'm talking about Twitter, I'm talking about Facebook. Who wants to come up? Tell us, are they using Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn? How are you using it? What do you think about it? And most importantly, have you been encouraged or have you bought any products because of the comments and opinions that you've heard on social media? Rick? Well, I'm not going to talk to Twitter and Facebook. I really don't use those that much. But LinkedIn, I started my job four days ago. It's all because of LinkedIn. I optimized my LinkedIn account, saw some presentations. I have over 500 connections. Once you get above 500, you're a player. And you, you rise to the top in LinkedIn. But I have business development manager in five places there. And a recruiter didn't find me. I didn't find the job I have. The hiring manager found me on LinkedIn. And that's how I got the job. And I've been looking for eight months. I was out in transition for eight months, and it's because of LinkedIn. Now, before that, I was in transition, and I got a job real quickly in a year, but I took the first one. That was also because of LinkedIn. So what I'll tell you, I call LinkedIn more of a business network as opposed to a social network. But take it really seriously, because it is a wonderful tool you made a lot of great connections with it, and you couldn't have your next career move because the hiring manager may find you. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, for that analysis. I, too, believe that LinkedIn is a very powerful tool. In fact, I think it's getting more and more robust <laughs> every day. In fact, now they have follow capability, kind of like Twitter, you can actually follow various individuals on LinkedIn, making the program even more strong. My second question. Earlier this week, in fact on Tuesday, I met with some colleagues from Washington, D.C., and I never saw so many sad faces in my life. And I said, what's the matter? And they said, well, look what happened last Friday. Last Friday night, our team the Nationals. It was a playoff game. We were up by six runs. And the, those darn Cardinals kept chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, and they beat us. The guy said, I was in a daze driving home. Another person said, I was crying on the way home. It was awful. Who can go ahead and analyze that game? Tell us what happened. <laughs> I see two. No. All right. Why don't you start? <laughs> Thank you, Table Topics Master, <coughs> fellow Toastmasters, welcome visitors, and distinguished guests. This topic brings a big smile to my face, as you can tell. I am a huge baseball fan. In this game, it did not look good for St. Louis early on. They got they allowed three in the first, three in the third. They were down six nothing after only three innings. 
But as any true baseball fan can tell you, St. Louis is a scrappy team. More importantly, they're experienced. Washington, a newbie on the national baseball scene, not so much. And St. Louis kept chipping away. One run here, two runs there. It's down to be 6-5. to five. Washington gets a run in the eighth. And St. Louis is down to their final out, their final strike in the ninth inning. Clutch at bats, up and down, a true run single to tie it up, true run single later on to win the game. And your friend was right, you could have heard a pin grab. But the game was sensational on so many levels. And the one thing that me as a hardcore baseball fan can draw from it, <laughs> you literally never give up if you keep having quality at bats and keep believing in yourself as a team. And on a personal Kansas note, I hope St. Louis does win the World Series, but that game is one for the ages. That's why baseball is the best game ever played. I'm not going to be in the NBA. I don't know how to skate. I, I, I like just playing hockey. But baseball is the one game that anybody in these guys can play. And I loved it. And I feel bad for Washington, but I'm more happy for St. Louis. <laughs> <laughs> Individuals want to speak to the table topic, which is quite all right. <laughs> I channel surfed, so every time there was a commercial, I went to another station. When I came back to the game, look at this the cards, they're coming back. Wow, commercial, watch something else, come back. Hey, another run. Commercial, watch something else, come back. Another two runs. I started sitting there thinking this. I'm drinking my Miller. Are they playing the Cubs? <laughs> <laughs> Deja vu, I've seen this before. Cubs, six runs, bottom of the eighth. Now you know what? By the top of the ninth, they lost the game. How does this happen? All I can say to those national fans is get over it. Chicago, the longest stretch in professional sports without a championship is the honor of the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> so, Nationals fans, get over it, live for another day, you'll find a reason to come back to the ballpark. Wrigley Field, smallest park in the league, two million people in the stands every year. Now, you don't have to have a winning team, you just have to have the right product and the right marketing mix. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Pete and Paul, for those insightful analysis of that, <laughs> that question. Well, question number three. By now, probably everybody has seen at least a small portion of either the presidential or the vice presidential debate. <laughs> it seems like when they're not wooing women, when they're not talking about burning coal, when they're not talking about Libya, the fiscal cliff, the 47 percent, we've heard those things already. Is there a topic that these individuals need to speak to right now? Oh, yes, sir. Yes. <laughs> One thing these guys have not addressed is what are they going to do in office? We hear the platitudes all the time. We hear the sickening plethoras and promises made by these politicians all the time. What are we going to do? What is it that he's going to do in office? Obama? Probably more of the same. Romney? Probably a little bit of a repeat of George Bush. What do we really need to get active change in this country? What is it that we really need to do to get actively acclimated and get these clowns out of this two-party system and acclimated? Well, I'm afraid we get the government we deserve. And that's because our own apathy towards our own elected offices, we expect Washington to solve them, but actually it's your problem. And it's your problem. If somebody could come up with a real solution to the problem, we might see some action in Washington. One small example I've learned about recently is something called thorium nuclear power. I won't explain what it is, but if you take a look at the Google it, you might find that it might be a solution to global warming. 
Another one might be the simple fact that you can take a look at some of the deficit reductions and what a village in Colorado did by putting its general ledger online. Various solutions, sometimes very simple, or perhaps maybe we could draw, draw the loss from Britain. Six weeks campaigning, two minutes to make your shot before the election day, and it's over. Take a look. There's solutions out there, but sometimes you're not given the best choice. But remember, we make them in the first place. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you, Tim, for that insightful response. I, I uh, can tell that you have thought about that, and that's an interesting uh, analysis. The final question of the evening. I was walking around the office today, and I noticed how many individuals really like to decorate for Halloween. In fact, I was thinking back to my own childhood, and Halloween for us was a huge event, a, a big event. I mean, there were so many different things that I could think to. Uh, just things that we totally enjoyed. Who wants to come up and tell us what their planning is for Halloween and maybe go back a little bit as to how they celebrated the, uh, the event as, as a child? I'm, I'm sorry. Toastmasters, honored guests. You see, I love Halloween. <laughs> I'm ready getting prepared. <laughs> My mom raised me, and there's only a few days in the year that you can really enjoy yourself and really have a good time. So every single holiday, we make the most of it. And for Halloween, ever since I was very little, of course, we had the costumes and the Halloween parties and start getting ready. And when my daughter was four years old, I was taking her to daycare in her Halloween costume, and she goes, Mommy, how come you don't have a costume on? And I said, well, we don't do that at work. And she goes, you don't have any fun? And I said, you're right. So I went upstairs and got dressed as a cat or something and went to work. Now, I have been getting dressed for 26 years, going to work. That's yeah. other people in the building, and I'm usually the only one. Sometimes one other person will wear a costume. And now, every year they go, you're getting dressed up again, right? What are you going to be this year? I said, I can't tell you. You might recognize me. I'm the only one. <laughs> and a couple of years ago, I dressed as a hippie. And I come in, and one of the big VPs go, how come you're not out smoking a joint? <laughs> <laughs> so I've already asked Joan if it's okay if I wear a costume part of the time at the fall conference. <laughs> Maybe I'll work up the nerve. So anyway, I love Halloween. I recommend you all do it at any age. Halloween is the one. with some really interesting and fun questions and when he's speaking in the club I always like being there because you never know what topic he'll come up with and he comes up with some of those interesting topics just like we can say Tim Bolger at top comes up with some very interesting topics that are very thought provoking so you have to attend for that. Uh, Donna was someone Halloween last year we put on special events and actually Donna and I were the only two that dressed up. She dressed up as she said as a hippie and I dressed up as Indiana Jones and at this special event, we're looking around, they're going, how come everybody else isn't dressed up? And she, and I, she and I had great fun with it. So now I'm going to turn over the second half of the meeting. I'm going to relinquish my control of the lectern. And I'm going to turn it over to our esteemed Lieutenant Governor Marketing, who's going to serve as our general evaluator. And that is Donna Weston. Donna. what the roles are for each of us during the meeting. So if you read the general evaluator, I'm supposed to evaluate the meeting as a whole, give some comments as to what went well and maybe a couple things we can improve on. And then I will be also introducing our other people that are part of the evaluation process. 
<clears throat> so first of all, we started the meeting a little late, but right at 7 o'clock, the Sergeant at Arms came up and said, five more minutes. Well, we actually started at eight minutes after. But there were a lot of people coming into the room, so that was probably, you know, a good decision. We had a couple of speakers that went a little over the allotted time. And I did notice that there isn't an ending time, so I guess <laughs> that gives us some leeway. But overall, I thought everybody did a very good job. It was a very interesting agenda. I'm sure Jerry and some of the other folks from the clubs had something to do with it. Uh, it was enjoyable to hear about the three different clubs and how they differ and when they meet. So our guests hopefully will take advantage of going to a couple of those clubs and seeing what they're like and thinking about joining. Uh, as far as the joke master, normally we just have one joke, uh, a longer joke, but that was kind of fun for a change. They have a few different ones and a few different topics, so kind of maybe everybody got something out of at least a couple of them. They were pretty fun. <laughs> I'm not supposed to mention anything about the speeches, but I think we had a couple of excellent speeches. John's was very personal, very inspiring, very, very motivating, and as well as our other speaker. He did a great job at trying to convince us to find our elements. Table topics, that was phenomenal. Those were great topics. You got people right away up talking <laughs> on uh, subjects that we're passionate about. And now I'd like to get to the evaluator part of the uh, program. So, which speech are we doing first? Nick is going to be evaluating John's Okay. So I'd like to call <coughs> up Nick. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Madam General Evaluator, Paul Toastmasters, and guests. I'd actually like to start my evaluation with a question. How many, how many of you know who LeBron James is? For those of you who don't know, he's probably the best player in the NBA, the National Basketball Association. I evaluated Jerry Evans a couple weeks ago, and I said, Jerry, evaluating you is like evaluating LeBron James playing basketball. Uh -huh. And tonight, evaluating John Lambie is like evaluating Michael Jordan. <laughs> so, it, was, it was a tough one, um, but I'm going to give it a try. John, I, I thought you gave a great speech, uh, letting Toastmasters change your life. You do so many of the fundamentals. Uh, your speech was, was organized. You had an intro. You had a body. You, you had a closing. You were very direct, which was important for this evaluation because you were trying to persuade the power. You have very confident body language, and you make eye contact with not just individuals, but the room. You use some nice vocal variety. You're very clear, but you went up to kind of get our, our attention, and you went low. And I actually wrote down, I wrote down James Earl Jones. <laughs> There's something about your voice that is distinctive that, that kind of makes you want to listen. Um, you use pauses extremely well. You almost started with the pause. You, you made this thinking gesture. And I'm really working on this, but I didn't hear one filler word throughout that whole speech. You really do a good job of modeling that we don't have to rush up here. When we're ready to talk, we'll talk. <clears throat> one of the favorite parts of the speech is you gave a great personal experience of Postmaster. And I really appreciate it. You started at your down moment. You talked about your depression. You talked about going to a meeting, then you started doing these evaluations, then you started doing demonstration meetings, and then you became an area governor. So it was a clear timeline, and you were kind of climbing that mountain. And you had a great close, let Toastmasters change your life. So in my feedback for you, I don't really have, well, you got to talk louder, you got to use your hands more. My feedback for you is, there are some guests here, but for the most part, um, there's a lot of Toastmasters. And you have a lot of conviction, but I'm going to challenge you to give this speech as if you're giving it to 50 people who are not Toastmasters. <coughs> and in that sense, if I'm not a Toastmaster and I walk in and you, you're using words like uh, competent communicator, icebreaker, um, area governor, I'm probably not going to know what that means. So. 
my challenge to you is to bridge what those words mean to what Toastmasters is. And I just wrote down some examples. Um, an icebreaker is not a speech, it's an achievement. Finishing your competent communicator is not a book, it's an accomplishment. The applause that we get that you talked about, that's encouragement, that's recognition. Your depression was, was, an, was an obstacle, just like we all have obstacles. Your demonstration meeting, that's knowledge. <coughs> um, an area governor is actually a leader. That's a leadership role. And Toastmasters is not a group, it's a community. So I think when you use those key words, then you're going to get those <coughs> people who are just walking in looking for something bigger. You're going to let Toastmasters change your life. But I look forward to more speeches. say to me that you're probably in the like it stage with Toastmasters. You're not, in, you're not into the I love it stage showing the passion. But I would like you to show more of the passion. And then also with the vocal comes the pauses. The ending, you should have paused with the quote by Michelangelo and then state the quote and then pause, and then maybe restate it again, because uh, I didn't write down fast enough with that quote. And I did the first time. I don't know where I put it, but I said, that's a pretty good quote. So I would have liked to then put in the pauses in there, because that, that helps your speech so much. <coughs> now is the preparedness of the talk. Um, the note cards you're using was a little bit distracting. <coughs> But you're saying, hey, I'm only giving my Ford speech. I can't be expected to memorize everything. And you're correct. But we have the PowerPoint. You can put your four points there. Your notes for everyone could see. And then you don't have to worry. And then if you do that, have your computer here that you can look at it and not looking at the screen to get what you're saying next. 
or a flip chart. Flip chart is the best thing. No notes, but a flip chart's okay, and you can put all your notes and what do you want on there. I would have liked also more talking about what your journey was, where you discovered your element. It was nice with Gabby, but that seemed kind of long. I would have liked more concentrating on yourself. And then, um, then for preparedness, because of the notes, I would have checked out when I found out that I was speaking here, I would have checked out this room before, days before, to see how am I, is, is there going to be a lectern for me? Can I put my notes that I don't have to worry about it? And then you might have said, well, gee, if, if I have to hold my notes, maybe that's not that good. Maybe I'll use a flip chart or a PowerPoint. So that's always a good, good thing to do. Uh, over that and the message that you gave was terrific. I said, as before in the first meeting I saw it, it has potential to be an international speech. So try the different things, get the passion. Most of all, that's the most important thing that you need to do. It has to be in your voice when you're talking, talking about that. Madam General, evaluate. Really believe in, and I really want to project it to 
John Labby all the way in the back. Okay? Kind of, as he said, scope out the room, pick a few people, and make sure you're projecting to them and giving them your story. Speaking of stories, you had some great stories of other people, and then you even had a story of your own. And I know Bob already addressed it, but one of the things that I was thinking of about your story was you were already in graduate school, and then you discovered what your passion was. It might have made the story a little bit more engaging if you had told us what you had previously planned on doing as a career and how watching this other person do coding, which I have to tell you, is not something that would excite me. <laughs> Sorry. Not my thing. I love, I love technology, but I want somebody else to do that work for me. So tell us more with that. And maybe as you relay that, a little more emotion will come through. Right? So whatever you started your career wanting to do, how you discovered this and really became passionate about it and then you loved it so much that you decided to go out on your own and then really be creative and do your own thing. I think that these, Bob was right. This would make a great international speech because everybody is looking for their, their calling in life and you may inspire someone else. So I look forward to more. Thank you. Do it. Comments? <laughs> are we doing a round robin on the open house or are we doing a round robin on one of the speeches? Evaluation. 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 Okay. Evaluation. Okay. So you know you got those sheets with four different quadrants. Anybody okay. took notes? Does anybody want to share some or... comments? I did better on Pete Russell on with JSC Postmasters. How long have you been a postmaster? Three months. Three months? You're at your fourth speech? Let me tell you my story. I gave my icebreaker, it was seven minutes, I read every word. I didn't give my second speech until July. It was five months before I figured out how to, how to do Toastmasters. And you obviously got to talk about what you're passionate about. And what I've learned, because I was a target speaker, and I did it four times this year, so I could progress. What I learned from people was, if you have props, you don't need your cards. Your props tell you where you are in your speech. And the other thing I was going to say is action cues. If you walk back and forth and you look at this end and you look at that end and you have a certain <coughs> hand gesture, that tells you where you are in your speech. Once again, you don't need your cue cards. And last but not least, your passion. I loved it. And you gave some great examples. But I was really hoping you were going to give us an example of passion, mm -hmm. like Admiral, I'm going to zip it up, zing it up, let's go for it. So I'm really hoping you had just a couple more examples of some different areas with the passion that we could all relate to. Other than that, for the fourth speech, I thought you did a heck of a job. Unlike Bob Roman, I believe in the use of note cards and notes for a speech. And I honestly thought the way you handled it was quite well and done great. You know, just having the note cards in here in the hand like this is a good way to use it. I know that when you're giving a, a longer speech, note cards are essential. I'm not going to, I would prefer not to use them if I can remember, but if I need to remember, I thought you did a good job in using them. Yes, Bob makes some very valid points about PowerPoint and other items, but I thought you did a good job with the note cards. Next time, tell us a story. <laughs> tell us a story. Sunrise Toastmaster. I concur with him in terms of using notes because on all occasions you won't be able to memorize a speech nor your salient points. What I have found that works is that little lecture right there. If you take your note cards and maybe number them, one, two, three, and four, and as you start to speak, 
You have carb number one here and carb number two here. And I learned this many years ago from a mentor. You never let people see your notes. And so as you finish with one card and you're making a speech, you slide that card over to the next side like that. And they never see you move the notes. Secondly, if you want to use that lectern, you can use larger sheets of paper. And then you can bullet point them and it's really, really large and you don't have to worry about finding your spot. Just little tips of the trade. You slide the thing across and you look at that part of the audience. And you know, rather than memorizing just the speech, memorize maybe one or two salient points that you can focus on. And when you focus on that, that gives you an opportunity to give some eye contact and to look at the people. And one last thing about your passion. When you speak of your passion, you have to let everybody feel it and say, and my passion is, is this, and let us feel the passion, but I commend you on that. And those are the little techniques that you learn later on in Toastmaster, but I recommend work on one thing at a time. And if you have to use notes up until your seventh speech, use notes up until that speech while you perfect those other things and gradually transition yourself out of that. Thank you. Govinder, it was a great speech, and you really had it. I, you had me. I was not only listening, I started writing it down. I, I heard the ideas coming across so well. They were clear. I want to reemphasize what I think several other speakers have said about the passion in this, this particular speech. You had the four points. You had, I like it. No, 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 no. There has to be almost a song to that word like. I like it. Okay? There had, and then every time you come back to that like, I like it. So that you are going to sing a song for like. Then you're going to sing a different song for oh, I love it. So you can, especially because it is about liking and loving and emotions and passion, <coughs> sing a song with each of those concepts. And I think it will come across so well. Evaluator, fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests, and most honored dignitaries. I would like to present the Grammarian's Report. For, first of all, the opening of the meeting, Devender, clean bill of health. Perfect grammar. Didn't catch anything there. Tom Smith, for the word of the day, you had four uhs and four ums. And by the way, if you had more than five ums or uhs, I'm just going to say more than five. Just, just so everybody knows that. For the invocation, Martina, <coughs> clean bill of health, no errors. Jerry Evans, our Toastmaster, I heard two ums, and there were a couple okays that I thought were maybe filler words, kind of inserting those. Our joke master, Glenn Reed, you did use the word of the day, I caught that, and you had four us. John Labby, one uh. Devinder, during your speech, I caught you doing a couple repeat words. I heard an as, as, and a let's, let's. And then also, again, pausing more and enunciating a little more, I think, would be your next step for your next speech. You had more than five uhs, two so's, and again, just the repeated words. Rick. You had more than five uhs, you had three ums, two so's, and one you know. Joe, congratulations, you had zero. Mike, table topic master, two uhs, one so, and one and. And Rick, during your table topics, zero errors. Paul, I had one uh when you were giving your table topics presentation. Pete, 
I heard uh, alls, like a, the word all with an S on the end when you were talking during table topics. And Tim, when you spoke during table topics, zero. Good job. <laughs> and on to Donna. When you were, I had a zero for when you did your table topics. I think it was on Halloween that you were speaking. Perfect. <laughs> when you were a general evaluator during that process, you had four us, you had three so's, and you had one you know. And then you also said it's ac it actually, it just kind of sounded like a filler at one point. Nick, when you were evaluating, you had one ah, uh, you had more than five ums. And I heard it actually in another, it was sounded like it was supposed to be a kind of, but it was a kind of, it just kind of sounded like a grammatical slang term. Valerie, when you were speaking, you had four us. You also use the word actually sometimes as a filler, I noticed. Two so's, two ands. You also repeated that's that a couple times as a filler, possibly. And then you said you actually get four people. I, again, I think the word actually probably could have been taken out of that context. Bob, during your evaluation, four us, two ums, two so's. And then Virginia, during your evaluation, all I heard was one you know. And that's my report. And now for our timers report to see how well we did within our time limit is Marianne Luckowitz. Good evening, Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honors of guests. Um, okay. That's two. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, uh, just your opening, Toastmasters, was uh, target time was two minutes. You were two minutes, 55 seconds. For the invocation, I uh, should have been two minutes. You, Martina, you were a minute and 32 seconds. Word master was, should be one minute. Tom, you were a minute 50. Joke master should be two minutes. Glenn, you were a minute 49. Grammarian, Amy, should be two to three minutes. You were three minutes, 33 seconds. Uh, speak uh, one, we did not have. Speaker two, John, uh, your target time was five to seven minutes. You were seven minutes, 52 seconds. Uh, speaker three, uh, Devinder, you were five to seven minute target time, you were 6 minutes 22 seconds. Uh, for the overview, Jerry, um, should have been, target time was 5 minutes, you were 7 minutes. Um, Rick, uh, target was 5 minutes, you were exactly 5 minutes. Uh, Joe, for the plus overview, uh, 5 minutes was the target time, you were 3 minutes 22 seconds. And Valerie, Five minutes was the target time. You were seven minutes, four seconds. Table topics. Uh, Rick, um, the target time is one to two minutes for the table top, uh, topics. Rick, you were one minute, 18 seconds. Paul, you were one minute, 47. Pete, you were one minute, 14. Tim, you were one minute, 55. Donna, you were one minute, 33. So great, you were all within the time limit for the uh, table topics. Evaluators, uh, Nick, you were to be two to three minutes was the target time. You were three minutes, 48 seconds. Uh, Virginia, you were three minutes, 23 seconds. Bob, you were four minutes, 58 seconds. That's it. Thank you. And now I turn the meeting. Oh, any other comments? <laughs> I have I have a quick favor to ask our toastmaster, or our on the audience in general. I missed our taping our target speaker at the Evanston contest. Henry Jiang, uh, after the meeting, if it's possible, I'd like to if if you guys would care to stick around. I need to do a retake, is what I'm saying. So I need to film him, and I need a few audience members, if they would beg their indulgence on having a retake of Henry's target speech. From that time. All right. I can see. Now. Thank you, Dr.
on them. What I'd like to do now is get some feedback from our guests, first of all, and any other general comments that you might have about the meeting overall. So if our guests would just like to tell us, did you enjoy the open house tonight? What did you think of it? What's your feedback? Uh, because we do value the feedback because when they talk about feedback being the breakfast of champions, it truly <laughs> is because that helps us improve for the next time. So any of our guests? The Shaw? Oh, yes. I like the positive environment here. And uh, I can learn from others' experiences. And it will help me in my day-to-day -day life make good decisions or better decisions. So overall I find this quite encouraging and inspiring for people who would like to join this post. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Michelle and I were emailing each other back to back and then I said, Michelle, why don't you go to Harper Toastmasters? So Michelle went yes. to Harper Toastmasters and I believe he's going to become, if he hasn't already, a member of Harper Toastmasters. So Terrific, Michelle. I appreciate it. Any other of our guests would like to... <coughs> Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Rohan. I thought this was a great event. Uh, uh, the speakers were really great, and uh, I'm convinced that I need to join Toastmasters <laughs> myself uh, to improve my communication skills and also to get over my depression. <laughs> <laughs> Share any comments for us? Sure. Uh, my name is Ruben Ramos. I've been here a couple of times already. Uh, Rick introduced me to Harper College Tolls Masters, and uh, I can say that uh, aside from the food, that was delicious. We, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, everyone here has definitely been forthcoming and very polite, and very open, and very honest and direct. And I appreciate you know you guys spending some time with me and introducing yourselves. And I'm looking forward uh, to signing up and. Nick's already got some of my information, so uh, you know, <laughs> looking forward to uh, to growing and you know bettering my uh, communication skills. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any of our guest Toastmasters would like to give us some feedback on the overall meeting tonight? Jeremiah, hi. Wait a minute, you're speechless, Jeremiah. No, no, no. Yes. Oh, I, you're speechless tonight. I can't believe that. It was a great evening. I appreciated everything. And I'm here because of the JED, that's the Jerry Evans effect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of that man right there. Oh, Anyone else? Any comments? Rick. Well, Jerry, what I, I would like to do, actually, tonight, I heard that Michelle joined tonight. Mm -hmm. Ruben's joining tonight, mm -hmm. and I think there were two other people that are joining clubs tonight, uh, and other clubs, and then we had one other member who sent in, she couldn't make it, she wanted to, but she joined, so we had three members join the Harper Club tonight, which I think is great. Thank you, Michelle and Ruben. <laughs> can I, can I hand? I, think, I think he's going to find a club that's suitable for him. There's only about ten clubs in Schaumburg, so <laughs> he should probably find one that, that okay. fits him. Let me thank all of you on behalf of Rick, myself, John Labby, Joe Rifkin. I would encourage all of you, when Donna, she started this program as part of a marketing program, she and I talked about this early on before the new Toastmaster year began, called Club Connection. And this is really what it's all about, is connecting with your fellow clubs. A lot of times, there's a club right down the street from us we never connect with them. We never reach outside of the four walls of our own club and meet Toastmasters from that club. And conversely, they never go outside of their confines and go to another club. So collaboration for us in this was to demonstrate that it is possible when Devinder talked about possibility. Because the collective consciousness of all three clubs and us learning from one another, because they have members you know, on a different part of the journey same thing with Toastmasters Plus, they have some experienced Toastmasters, and then advanced, or rather top Toastmasters, where we primarily have more experienced Toastmasters, but we all learn from one another, and we can all draw from one another. So when you go back to your respective clubs, please share with them what you experienced tonight, and I would encourage and challenge all of you, you can have your own event. Get with another club, have your open house, have a special event, bring in a guest speaker, Diane would love to talk to you about 
environmental issues, and she is the composting queen. She can talk to you all day long about composting. But on a serious note, she would love to come and visit your club and talk about a lot of different topics. I'm sure Valerie, when she was talking about when we were giving the overview of top, if you're giving a presentation and you want to go to a different club, reach out to that other club. Ask to be put on the agenda. Fulfill a functionary role to complete your CL manual, to get through your CC manual. Bob, when I started, he encouraged me early on, Jerry, the way you'll grow and learn the fastest is by going outside of Mount Prospect Toastmasters. Get out of the confines of your comfort zone. And I took his advice along with Dick Storer, and now four years later, it's amazing to me what I've been able to do in four years, simply because I got out of my comfort zone and still continue to do that today. Di? I just finished my third ambassador. I have to commend you for that program because I just visited UL yesterday and I've learned so much from visiting Arlington Heights and I've been to some of the Schaumburg clubs. Do. Toastmasters is an open door policy to anyone who's interested in coming in and respectfully sharing. And I think that there is just no place on earth that offers that support. So if you haven't done the ambassador program yet, get out there and do it because it's fabulous. I had the opportunity to go to JSC North. Rick and I went there just last week, as a matter of fact. Last week, Thursday. Was it Thursday? Monday. 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 Was it Monday? Monday. <laughs> but going to JSC, JSC, John Lavy and I were involved in that, and so was Valerie when we first started that club in Schaumburg. It spawned a second club, and now it spawned a third club. So it started in Schaumburg, Palatine, and now JSC North. And you want to talk about a supportive environment for folks that are in transition. J JSC and Toastmasters, it's, it fits like a glove. Because when you go to their meetings and folks that are in transition, and they want to improve their interviewing skills, a lot of them haven't interviewed in a long time perhaps, haven't had to have that, that experience, that frightening experience. So they really support the people that come to the JSC. And in fact, Rosemary Monahan, who is um, the president, I guess you could call her right? She's the facilitator for JSC. Facilitator groups. Yeah, for JSC. She said, Jerry, she goes, Toastmasters and JSC, she goes, it's just a phenomenal fit for one another. What is JSC? Job Search Circle. And it's for people primarily in transition. I think, Pete, there's what, in Rick, 1,500? How many 2, members? 2,000. 2,000 members. 2,000 members. And they're a very vibrant group. But that just shows you how one connecting up with another one, John was involved in the second one, and then now the third one, they love Toastmasters. They can see the real value of Toastmasters and the benefits of it. So my challenge again to all of you is speak to one. Just share it with someone else. Share that gift with someone else because you never know when they might need it. When they're in transition, you might be in a position to help that person. Vice versa, they might be in a position to help you in some way or another. Pete. Yeah, just real quick on that, and the synergy between our organization, JSC, and Toastmasters. If you're in transition, and you don't want to be in transition, and you want to maintain your skills, what Toastmasters offers you is an opportunity to be in an office environment and improve your skills. That way you stay sharp. The other thing it allows you to do, Virginia's from UL. Rick is from Standard Register. There are so many companies, Fortune 500 companies and other companies, that have closed clubs. You can't walk in off the street and be a member. But if you have a passion, and it's Motorola or RIM, and you want to go there, they might have an in-house club. Guess what? You got by the gatekeeper. Now you're going to meet with 20 people you have something in common with. <clears throat> professional growth. So if you're in transition, okay. you know somebody in transition, friend or family, I think Toastmasters is a great thing to do. My last comment is Barry obviously is not here this evening because he probably he lives on South Shore mm -hmm. and literally it's 60 miles for him to drive one way. Not that some of you didn't make a similar distance, but he got caught up in traffic so unfortunately he wasn't able to make it. However, we were going to celebrate his birthday. So I brought a birthday cake for Barry which I will razz him about later on this evening. Okay. Can I take a picture? 
Yes, we'll take a picture right. of the cake. But I want to bring out the cake, and then we'll cut it up. So those of you that want to stay around, please have some of the cake. Okay. Enjoy the rest of the food, whatever there is remaining of the food. Fellowship, and as Tim said, if you want to stick around, Henry is going to give his humorous speech. So if you'd like to hear him give that speech, because Tim wants to record it, then you're more than welcome to do that. But on behalf, again, of Rick Westcott, myself, John Lavie, Joe Ripken, thank you all for coming this evening. This could not have happen without all of you being here. Okay. So thank you for the bottom. Yes, Amy. Thank you, Jerry, for being our Toastmaster. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the rest of the week. Thank you.